Hi, and welcome to Easel Studio, your weekly hepatology broadcast news. In today's episode, we will talk about artificial intelligence. What is it actually? Why should we care about AI? How can we learn AI? What are the dangers of using AI? And why should professional societies like Easel care about AI? So my name is Jakob Carter. I'm a medical doctor and an AI researcher from Dresden in Germany. I used to work a few years in hepatology and now I lead an interdisciplinary research team. What we are doing is to develop um, better biomarkers for our patients. And with me tonight are four guests and it's my great pleasure to introduce them very briefly to you so um, before we dive right in. So first, my, first of all, let me introduce Julia Calderaro um, from Créteil in France. He is a leading expert in liver pathology and a thought leader in AI and pathology. And then, hi, Julia. Um, then we have um, Arcella Prilai from Milano in Italy. She's a medical oncologist and an expert in AI applied to oncology. She's very active in professional societies in Europe and especially active and leading international research consortia on AI. And, and it's great to have you with us. And um, we have um, Tobias Serafin from Düsseldorf in Germany. So he's a medical resident in hepatology and leads a junior research group on AI biomarkers at the University Hospital in Düsseldorf. Um, and then we have Katie Wagg from Boston in the United States. Thank you for joining us here. Um, Katie is a cell biologist and she has years of lab experience in liver research. Now she's working at Path AI, which is a Boston-based AI company, which is very active in the hepatology field as well. So thank you all for joining tonight's discussion round. And let's dive in um, with the first question. So um, my first question is for Arcella. Ar Arcella, as a, medical, as a medical oncologist, can you explain to us what is AI? Can you explain that so that medical doctors understand what it is? So yes, thank you, Jacob. Thank you to everyone. I'm very happy to be here in this discussion. And um, so I was thinking about this uh, question, and I think that uh, simply um, the first thing that I can say for medical doctor, AI, it's a new uh, method, simply a new tool. So uh, I think that it can, we can think that AI, um, however the roots are from classical statistics, but it can, can go beyond related to its power to analyze, uh, analyze the data. Obviously, we know that uh, today, so especially in oncology, we have many, many data. And uh, what we are trying to do with th these new tools so and this new methodology is to put this data together and understand more about them. So uh, probably uh, one of the um, ideas that I have why, for example, with precision oncology, we remain um, uh, in, I, I can say we, ha we are now in a plateau uh, moment uh, to bring the precision oncology in clinical practice because we really need to valorize the data. But mm -hmm. I think that to val valorize the data, we need to understand and we need to analyze them with, uh, with these new tools. So for medical oncologists, I can um, I can say that there are two main uh, important things so for AI tool. The first one is the input, which are our data, okay? <laughs> and um, uh, the second um, important and that, that's uh, that's the like the the garbage in garbage out right so if we if we have um, bad data we will have bad results right so that's something exactly uh, a general and, principle yeah. Yeah. And, the, and the, for, for medical oncology, Jacob, I think that another important thing is to know about the data is that, for example, uh, for bioengineer, the data and data scientists are mm -hmm. best. And so we absolutely in oncology, there, there are two main things that we have, for example, relate to big data. We have the diversity of the data, which is very important, but uh, unfortunately, we do not have the high volume, which, for example, in other sectors, it's very, very important mm -hmm. also for AI. 
So, uh, and just to, 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 to give this message that for AI, so, and big data, we, yes, we need to talk about with the diversity and the high dimensionality of uh, mm -hmm. different data, but we absolutely need also a lot of passion to analyze this data and to, and to learn this tool with, uh, with this feed data. Why? Because after that, we need an outcome. Which yeah, no, absolutely. absolutely. Wow, thank you for you touched upon many, many things that we are going to dis discuss tonight, um, Arcella. And I love that you start with the clinical data because AI is just, um, I agree, AI is just a tool to make, uh, to, to unlock some of the value that's hidden in that, in that data, right? So thank you so much for providing like the the medical perspective on AI. If we are talking about hepatology and liver medicine, there's other specialties involved, right? And one of these specialties, which is usually our ground truth for many, many diagnoses and many biomarkers is histopathology, right? So we cannot live, we cannot do any uh, liver medicine without um, without histopathology in many cases. And so, Julien, you're, you're representing... Um, the histopathology side here, and we were discussing already about diversity and large volumes of data, and I think this is especially interesting for for you, right? What what is your opinion? What what role could AI play in 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 liver pathology? So uh, thank you, Jacob. So I think first, uh, AI is really particularly fit for images. Uh, mm -hmm. Because, you know, the, the information is an image is really complex. You have the, the value, of course, of the pixels. You have also all the spatial relationships. And that is something that is really difficult to, to process and to analyze uh, by the human eye. And we as pathologists, as you may know, we, we love doing scores and things like that. So it's nice and they're very useful. But the, the main problem that we have is that uh, there is still a significant uh, inter and even intra observer variability mm -hmm. and for example that is a problem when you have uh, histological endpoints that are uh, the histological uh, features that are endpoints for trials and i think we see that for example for nash and i think in the field of liver pathology what is really needed now is to standardize all these processes uh, like also the assessment of fibrosis and other features to give really reliable and robust scores uh, that can be applied across uh, clinical trials so we can compare uh, different cohorts of patients because you know even for NASH there are different scores when you're on, on the US or in Europe and I think AI has a key role to play in the standardization of mm -hmm. all that and we can relatively easily have uh, like a, a percentage of fibrosis in the tissue. We can have an assessment of steatosis and everything that is relatively easy uh, with AI. For, for diagnosis, it's a little bit more complicated, I would say, because um, uh, in a liver biopsy, there are many diagnoses that are uh, possible. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's more difficult, but I think really the 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 hot topic now is the standardization of all these uh, scoring systems okay yeah that makes that makes sense so so julien can you be honest what you would you trust more an ai based um steatosis score or a steatosis score <laughs> obtained by a by a human colleague so that's a, a really good question um i will just answer by taking another situation for a cancer I will mm -hmm. trust, so far, I will trust more the pathologist. Okay. For the assessment, for example, of a percentage of steatosis, maybe I would trust more a good model than a, a human <laughs> observer. <laughs> oh, great. Yeah, no, that's... Yeah, that's 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 very interesting. And it's, I think um, I would love to hear Katie's perspective on this because this these are exactly the things that you are building in your in 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 your current current job, right? These 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 models to 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 satisfy this need for inter-observer variability and standardization and outcome assessment. Is that is that right? Can you can you tell us a little bit about your 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 mission there? Yes, exactly. And I think, you know, echoing a lot of what Julian just said, um, I think I would trust the machine plus the human plus the pathologist more than either one. Um, 
because exactly for the reasons you said, uh, pathologists are evaluating the whole slide image for many different factors for, for diagnoses, other findings. But it is true that, you know, our current challenges in clinical trials in being able to consistently enroll based on some of these scores and uh, measure change over time across phases of trials across drug targets, we cannot do that right now, given the intra and inter uh, observer variability. So I think it's important to, to have both AI that sort of replicates the current uh, endpoints um, that can be achieved by manual pathology and just giving the pathologist a tool to increase their precision, but also building these platforms so that the pathologist can continue to do his or her job, um, which goes well beyond pulling out some of these histologic features and scoring. But then as, uh, as we were talking about before, there's also so much information to unlock in that intricate structure and function relationship in the liver. And I think at the same time, we can go well beyond uh, these scoring methods. We can look into um, drug specific response. Um, we can look into who's gonna be a, a fast responder or a fast progressor versus a slow progressor. Um, there's, we can serve as ground truth, for instance, to look at more non-invasive uh, measures uh, because you need a precise tool to, to really measure change um, to really serve as a ground truth against some of these non-invasive tests. So I think there, there's a lot of ways uh, that we are sort of trying to meet the field where it's at with the current endpoints, but also to go uh, well beyond where we currently are. And that's true for in the oncology field too, unlocking the tumor microenvironment uh, and really understanding um, changes and response to therapeutics over time. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. I, th I think this is very interesting. My takeaway is that... Um, um, AI can help with enrollment into clinical trials, prediction of response, and outcome assessment. Is that is that right? So it can uh, really really help us potentially in many many aspects of clinical trials. Is very that, much. Yeah. Yeah. Very. No, wait, I, I, Julia. I just like yes to add that. Uh, uh, I think that uh, we are at a point wh when we have images and whole slide images. Like mm -hmm. a human pathologist may be overwhelmed by the amount of information that is on the slide. So we look at features that we were taught during our residency to identify, but we miss other things that are not that obvious and that could still be included in the analysis and that could, uh, as Cathy said, be related to response or progression of disease. And also uh, that's why I, I, I would say that we're, we're uh, not like dinosaurs. I don't think we will disappear mm -hmm. uh, really soon, but I really think this is a really exciting time for pathology because you know, the, the old h &E is really now getting a lot of uh, attention and probably a few, like a decade away, mm -hmm. everybody thought uh, uh, h and &E was uh, like uh, the past and there was all this molecular testing, the other, other things. And now we can see that in the h and &E section, there are so many things also that we didn't know they were there and they were related to prognosis, to drug right. response. And to identify that we cannot do that by ourselves and definitely we need AI. So I think in the future, we will make a diagnosis, for example, I don't know, liver cancer, and then we will run other models and we will have reports with the diagnosis, the conventional diagnosis, but also we can add uh, predictions of different models uh, provided that they are uh, robust. And I really think this will bring even a more a central place for pathology in uh, cancer, but also in non-neoplastic diseases. Oh, I love that. That's a very optimistic view. And yeah. <laughs> I, I, it really makes sense for me. And, and what an interesting plot Thanks. twist, right? Like uh, uh, 10, 20 years ago, some people thought morphology would go away because we would just sequence everything and yeah. <laughs> then get the report back from the computer. But now really it turns out morphology is the next big, uh, the next, the next big thing. And we can really get so much more out of this morphology. So uh, yeah, what an interesting time to be alive. And um, one one topic that was mentioned, I think, by, by several of you is um, 
is how how all of these aspects relate to medical training and uh, i think that is really um, there's there's really a crucial aspect here. I, as a medical doctor, I think all physicians should be aware of, of this technology and should understand the limitations and what it can actually do. But then also we, of course, need physician scientists to do clinical work and research at the same time and use this to build better biomarkers. And I think um, one of the, the blueprints for this um, generation of, of physician scientists in the AI era is Tobias, who we have here, who, who is building his junior research group in Düsseldorf, focus on AI and hepatology. So Tobias, maybe you can give us a, a personal statement. What inspired you to become an um, AI hepatologist or to start on that, that career path? Actually, yeah, th thank you very much um, for, for the question and thanks for the opportunity to, to give my uh, <laughs> part here. And actually, all of you touched a lot of these uh, subjects. I mean, yeah, I, I did my uh, doctorate thesis in epidemiology, so I started to do R statistics, so I got a bit into basic programming. But mm -hmm. soon you you encounter like very complex data. So this is what, what Julian, what you said, like images, these are super complex data and multidimensional. And um, when I got confronted with AI and had the opportunity to learn about it, I thought, okay, this is somewhat great because it's a method as uh, Nasala, as you said in the beginning, like it's really a method which all of us will need in the future when we work in hospitals, I'm, I'm sure about it. And uh, Katie, what, what you said that you would trust a machine, like a machine learning algorithm together with a human more than either of them alone. I totally agree with that. So really from the beginning, when I heard about this topic, what inspired me was the, the thinking of not only in pathology, like Julian, what you referred to saying, okay, maybe one day we will have scores and outcome predictions directly from histopathology, but like an AI in a tumor board is really an idea which I somehow love. There are so many different data inputs coming to my mind when I'm working on a ward as a, as a medical doctor in training, usually I'm not the one interpreting all of them, but I'm the one going into tumor board, presenting my patient, and then experts sitting together, discussing the case from radiology, um, patho histopathology, like really oncologists, and all of them gather their ideas. So I think this is a perfect example where I, AI could help like combine data and also give some kind of prediction for therapy outcome whatever yeah i think that's a great point that you know we we don't need to talk about imaging alone or genomic data alone that you can have all of these tangential uh lines of evidence sort of come together in both training a model and integrating that information to produce insights so it does there's you know talking about complex images but you also have so much other data that you have to sort through and um there's so many insights to be gained that we can't really pull out um alone oh that's a very interesting point thanks for bringing that up so um i think one of the um one of the keywords that i've heard a lot of times recently is multimodal data integration um because right now um we have very good technical models technical capabilities to um not just analyze one type of data but maybe bring different types of data together although this becomes then much more challenging in, in in the real world maybe maybe Arcella you can comment on this because I know that's one of your main focus areas to find new in your case um, immunotherapy biomarkers based on multimodal based on multimodal data integration so do you do you really believe that this is the this is the future or is it um will this just unnecessarily blow up the complexity of um of ai systems in medicine so i think both so first of all as i mean you know um Jacob and all you know is that one of the most challenging in immunotherapy field is finding, I mean, this famous biomarker that we will never find and think uh, as, a, as a singular biomarker, because we know that, for example, we have learned a lot from binary biomarkers in the AGFR patient, for example, in non-small cell lung cancer, just to give an example. And we know that we are not in this, I mean, in, in immunotherapy is very complex. And I think one of the, um, when I thought four years ago to start my PhD, I really 
uh, thought about the complexity. And uh, the first message is the, the idea is that probably we were looking in 10 years, we have looked on many, many biomarkers, for example, real world data biomarkers, biological biomarkers. And the idea is that we have all these biomarkers there and all of them, a lot of them are very good biomarkers, but we don't know who to believe. But the, the question is, do we need to believe one, just one biomarker in immunotherapy? We know that every each of us have different, you know, uh, as exactly, mm, for example, Katie said, um, the immunotherapy with uh, the, all the context of the, uh, our immune system, tumor microenvironment. So it's very a plethora of biomarkers there, which I think so. The idea was very simple, like a BIMBY in it. So putting all these data and biomarkers together, maybe we can to build not only a complex biomarker, but we can understand from all of them. So for example, personalizing in the same individual fashion and okay, and uh, what if we try to look also, for example, with these method, methodologies, uh, also in the interaction that these biomarkers have between us, not only the singular biomarker, which for actually is the case that we are looking with the imaging, no? for, because, because what uh, Julien said before, you want to look beyond your eye. And the idea is I want, as a clinical oncology, want to look beyond my eye. So beyond ECOG, beyond, um, um, for example, uh, um, neutrophil lymphocyte ratio. And I'd like to understand, okay, but there is a kind of connection also between them. And so with this complex, uh, obviously, uh, new methods, I can try to understand a bit more. Okay, yeah, that that makes so 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 intuitively it makes sense not just to rely on one single data source and one single biomarker, but to put several things together, right? And of course, let's remember we are talking to a hepatology and liver oncology audience here, not not lung cancer, and where we have many many biomarkers. So it seems to be much more challenging even uh, in 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 hepatology and um and 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 liver oncology. Maybe for the for this um maybe Katie you can comment on that because you are actively building biomarkers in collaboration also with um um with with pharma companies who are developing new new drugs right companion diagnostics what do you think is this all becoming too complex also from a regulatory point of view would you prefer just to have one single very simple biomarker or do you really share this this vision of having complex multimodal biomarkers or is this a regulatory nightmare or a practical nightmare what, what's your view on that katie uh i i think we need both i think we need to consider you know everything from translational research to to clinical adoption and none of those in isolation um, i think we need to sort of approach the regulatory landscape where we currently are um, and really as i said build tools for pathologists that have interpretable results to begin with um, to sort of serve as a bridge to then also go beyond and provide more complex readouts. Um, I think that we need to tackle uh, sort of the very important but less interesting to talk about standardization of inputs, um, data integrity, <laughs> uh, what's going into to training, how do we compare model to model um, when it could be just apples and oranges and, and sort of what the inputs are. And so I think, you know, a lot of the challenges we have in product development uh, beyond just building thing, bu building products that are actually helpful, um, you know, where clinicians and pathologists have been the guide in what we should build is how can we uh, reduce the risks and prove that these tools are safe and effective for whatever context of use um, and really not introduce more risk into some of these clinical trials. And so we have to take into account, you know, a whole host of pre-analytic factors, the metadata that's coming in surrounding this to ensure that it's of high quality, um, the staining variability, the scanner image quality variability. And so it is, it's very complex, but that's exactly why you need uh, machine learning engineers, quality people, software engineers, biologists, pathologists, all working together uh, to sort of, no one can understand all of this and be an expert in all of these areas. And I think that um, we come together and we work with the regulators. We sort of meet them where they are now and we propose 
Um, you know, one of the challenges is that we can build better versions of these. We lock an algorithm. We've already have more insights into what the next improvement could be. How do we shorten that time then to bridge um, beyond, you know, bridge to the current accepted methods to go beyond? And so, yeah, it is it is a complex problem and it takes a lot of collaboration, but I think it's it's doable and we are doing it. Um, you can see there there is an AI based tool out there for prostate right now. Um, and we are using uh, our um, AI based uh, algorithms for NASH in many, many clinical trials. So it is happening. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I think, yeah, thanks for bringing up these examples, because, um, yeah, maybe it's a good point to remind the audience that AI is not just speculative somewhere in the future, but it is right, right here, and we have, um, we have more than a dozen um, clinically approved AI algorithms, which you can use nowadays in medicine for polyp detection in endoscopy, for digital pathology, for radiology, for dermatology. So these things have all come to the market in the last couple of years. So, so we can already use it. It's already becoming a, a reality, right? So, but it's, it's just the beginning. It's just going to take take off yeah so and mitigating yeah. risks um you know yeah. the 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 biggest way to do that is to build tools that pathologists can use and have control over so uh the pathologist is still making ultimate decisions they're just they're using these tools right now mm -hmm. to make them and i i would like also to to underscore that like regarding pathology but i think this will be true uh, also for other other fields we need also uh, models that will take into account the uncertainty because that's okay if, for example, the model does not give uh, yes or no, but says maybe or I don't know. It's very important. The thing that we need is when we have a, an output, when we have an answer from the model, we have to be uh, almost 100% sure. And I think it's okay even if half of the cases are uncertain. And that's something that we do not see so far in publication. It's it's coming. We see now some, some papers that address this problem. But I think that's really something we have to consider now uh, because uh, we need to have answers in really with a 100% uh, almost uh, precision. And even if it helps a majority, I don't know, 20, 30% uh, of patient and it helps in this subset of cases, that will still be a, a really a, a good improvement. So we mm -hmm. run a model, for example, on a prostate biopsy. It says cancer uh, or not cancer, but I think it's okay if it also says this data does not look like uh, to mm -hmm. the data uh, which I was trained on and mm -hmm. I prefer not to give an answer, that, that will be great. <laughs> yeah, so uh, absolutely. So let's, I, oh, I love these points. So, so from a, the, so let's just recap. Um, so multimodal data integration, very complex AI models make sense intuitively, right? We want them to make sense of our data, but there are some challenges here that we need to 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 be mindful of. And um, Katie brought up um, regulatory challenges to this and making sure the system is giving consistent output. But Julien, you also brought up the um, the uncertainty um, aspect and the, the the abilities of models to say, I don't know, this is not what I was trained on, right? So these are, I think, technical, um, administrative um, challenges. One other challenge that I would like to bring up, and I would um, specifically ask Tobias and um, maybe to comment on that, is um, the availability of the of the of the data, um, because. Um, um, Tobias, as we are both um, working in the, in, in the medical in the healthcare system in Germany, which um, has some good aspects, but but maybe digitalization is not one of the strongest aspects here, right? So I think we were both when as residents on the on the internal medicine wards, we made like handwritten um, and nodes and handwritten orders for drugs. And of course, this is horrible. I mean, we are in 2023 now. Um, we are still using fax machines every day. Um, are you are you frustrated with that? Maybe a little bit that in your in your free time, you only you you're on your phone constantly, and then at work you have to go back to the and learn what a fax machine is. And and what does what is the what is the connection to AI? Do you think we can ever digitalize our healthcare system so that we can make the data usable for AI? Maybe a personal statement. 
I mean, it's a, yeah, it's a hot topic for me. The, the research I'm doing is so far away from what my daily business in the hospital. Mm -hmm. So I'm not allowed to send mm -hmm. patients uh, by mail their like met doctor letter. So I can't mm -hmm. tell them the diagnosis by, via email since they are considered like not safe enough, but I can fax it. And um, yeah, the data is handwritten most of the times uh, still in our hospital and for many big hospitals in Germany, this is just truth. I don't know, I think in the US it might be better and in France maybe too, but like the availability of data is a big issue. And um, I think also the availability of data is very, very important when it gets to training of models and also like good models and models we want to use in, in our daily life since the input data is so important as all of you just said like there are so many biases which can get introduced when you have just like maybe just from one hospital in germany you have like digitized data and you just train on that but all the people living there are white and then you want to use it for others which are non non white people so there are big biases introduced we have seen that for facial recognition we have seen that I think Amazon or Meta had like a pre-screening tool uh, for their applications um, for employees and they took it back just because of racial biases within the model. So definitely data availability in Germany at the moment is horrible. And if we want to have really usable models, we will need big data and we will need real world data from many hospitals. So. Oh, yeah. yeah. Th thank you very much, Tobias, for making this strong statement. And we are already 30 minutes into our podcast. Unbelievable. I mean, there's so many things we could discuss. I think we should we could talk for hours. Um, so maybe our listeners um, can just take this also as an inspiration to dive dive in more deeply into these topics. So I think what we should do right now is already start our final round where maybe we can have just a, um, a short comment by, by the panel on, on, on a topic that's very relevant and very dear to your heart. So, so kind of a takeaway message for, from today's very brief discussion. And I'd like to start with Arcella actually, because um, Toby brought up a uh, a concept, real world data, um, that I know is very dear to you, um, and um, maybe you want to 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 comment um, on on that in your in your final statement. What is real world data? Is this a thing that well, we should be a uh, concept that we should be 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 aware? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, so there, I think that uh, this concept is a bit old, and as you know, uh, Jacob, uh, um, I mean, also the real world data concept, also with imaging, so radiomics and pathomics for sure we've changed. So, and the, the very good thing here, as uh, as I said in the beginning of this podcast, is that um, AI not only will bring us and valorize what we had from um, other precision oncology and translational data, but the, the, the new thing is that it's sending us this. Um, uh, giving us new biomarkers, so new type of that we had there and we didn't use them before. So this is a very so two type of of uh, very good things. And the other point, which I I absolutely agree with Tobias, and now you know, Jacko, we are I mean developing more and more data driven their world, real world data master protocols in order to uh, between uh, different networks. So for example, national and international networks. Um, so try to have these data driven uh, protocols and put the data together because the big data means also volume so it's very important mm -hmm. However, in the other point, just the, the, the final thing is that we have to, um, we, we need also AI here because we know that our different methods, for example, I just mentioned federated learning, but you know, no, that we can help a bit us to go beyond these data um, and sharing and protection uh, um, problems. So uh, I think that AIs can, can try a bit to help us in many, many fields. So in, in this. And just a fancy message mm -hmm. here, but uh, uh, I think that it, 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 it doesn't finish here because we have just started with this new technology. So just mm -hmm. you imagine that after many, many years, we will be there and we will listen about, for example, quantum science that we are set. So everything will change in very, very fast. So uh, and the training, the education here is a very great message. So we need this techno oncologist and the techno maths people that need absolutely so 
uh, new knowledge and education. So we will not be the, the guys that will will bring the AI. So our uh, <laughs> other medical doctors will will be the very very technologists. I think so. Um, that thank you. More. Thank you so much, Arcella, and thank you for being a role model for this, for these, for these developments. Um, yeah, and and yeah, I, I love what you said that it's just the beginning. So a new, completely new world is just starting. I think that's that's that that became quite obvious in the in the last couple of months, and it's a very very exciting time to do this type of research as you are doing. Thank you. So um, let's go on with our um, final statements. Um, maybe, um, maybe Katie, can I can I ask you to comment on maybe also a bit of a personal statement because you um, were working in academia and liver research for a long time, and I know you you enjoyed that, but now you've moved to industry, um, still working with research, very close to research. Um, so you know both worlds very intimately. What's your view on the potential synergy between academia and industry when it comes to bringing AI to the ground and making a real, real world impact? What's your What's your conclusion after your 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 long journey? Ooh, uh, so <laughs> I think I mean it just highlights the importance for collaboration, for collaboration between academia and industry, um, both in, you know, guiding what products should we be making, how, what are the limitations um, and benefits, and how do we monitor them in the real world, as well as improve them. Um, but I, I also think that just coming from the field of liver research, there's, there's so much to be learned from some of these preclinical models of, you know, liver regeneration. What does it, what does a healing liver look like? Um, right now we're me measuring efficacy with systems, for example, in NASH that were built to score to aid in diagnosis, not necessarily to capture um, liver healing um, in response to, to medicine. So I think working with academia to really uh, better understand what should we be looking at? What should we be building for very specific contexts of use, either within trials to measure efficacy or in the clinic uh, to aid in diagnosis? And I think making sure uh, it was very, very good point around that we are building models with data that is not biased because of data availability. Um, we need to share. We need to share data and uh, between academia and industry and across industry um, so that we can be be building uh, the best tools we can for patients. Thank you so much, Katie. So that's a common vision, right? To, to, to build the best tools for our patients that we are all um, sharing. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Tobias, I would like to ask you for a final statement. And um, and sorry to put you in the spotlight, but there's one thing that we did not mention here in, in the last 30 minutes, and that's chat GPT. So we cannot have any um, podcast on AI in this month without mentioning this. Can I just ask you in your final statement to just comment briefly on what is chat GPT and, and, and should people log into that website and check it out? Or is it, uh, is it, is it, is it not, for, not recommended in your point of view? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, ChatGPT has been a hot topic, and it, it's fun because it it, uh, it reaches out now in many ways to my daily life. Somehow, people read about it, people ask me about it, and you you find the new newspapers articles, and I think it's re it really brought the whole AI topic one step forward, and makes it very accessible for everyone. So ChatGPT is like a large language model that it has been trained in reinforcement learning but also with some human supervision in the beginning and um so i think it's a great tool actually and i think if you're a medical student or a young doctor and you think okay i want to go into ai but our programming is super hard then just give chat gpt a try and ask it how can i i don't know program uh, a little program which changes all the file names in my folder and it will give you an answer. And most of the time it works. So that's really great about it. Like it, it really makes also programming very approachable, mm -hmm. but you can also ask it, uh, how, how do I look splendid on my next wedding or something? It will also <laughs> give you an answer. 
but you just need to be very cautious since it sometimes gives very plausible answers and they sound plausible like we now all do but you can't really on the fly uh, check if we're saying the truth so now also me speaking i could tell you anything because you can't check while i'm talking and so just make sure that you don't just trust jet gpt i think jacob you you ask it if uh, what is heavier like one kilogram of lead or 2000 grams of feather and then it wrote an answer saying like yeah well you know one kilogram uh, of lead and 2000 kilograms of feather weigh exactly the same they both weigh two kilograms of uh, two great kilograms so it sounds very plausible but just be cautious about it Thank you so much for wrapping up this this topic um, here and for um, for for mentioning and explaining ChatGPT and we are almost at the limit of our of our time here. What we have covered is really a mishmash of many many topics and I think this shows the the audience just how much there is to discuss about. We could have a hour long podcast about. AI and pathology, AI and clinical trials, AI and clinic preclinical research, AI multimodal AI. Um, so, so I think this was just a teaser. And maybe Julien, my very last question for the audience: If they want to learn more about AI, what what would be your um, your 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 maybe twenty second um, recommendation for them? Um, um so i think they should uh just use, just use for example chat gpt if they want to learn mm -hmm. uh, they, but there are so now plenty of resources and also free resources you just like google the the ai and the kind of networks you want to to dive in uh, the gan or other types and there are so many resources free resources and i think this is a great point for all this community there are many open source software many people that are willing to teach uh freely um really the 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 the, the main concepts of artificial intelligence and i would just like to hand on chat gpt i must admit that at Sometimes I'm very excited about it, and sometimes it's it's a little bit scary. I think, <laughs> and um, because this is a this is not the the I think this was evolve and it will get better, and I think at some time uh, we will not be able to tell if it has been made by a human or by an AI. So th this is just a personal reflection. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, Julian, and thank you everybody for. Um, on the panel for for discussing tonight um, um i really really appreciate the time and the thoughts that you put into this and now we are at the end of our discussion so thank you again and i want to thank the audience also for tuning in um thank you everybody for for discussing and sharing your experiences on ai and hepatology i think we have learned a lot today i hope everybody has i hope it has um sparked some interest to do some further research and with this this concludes today's episode of easel studio uh, which is your weekly hepatology broadcast news and next week we are going to be talking about organ preservation in lipid transplantation so remember to become a, me a member of EASL and join the EASL family, please. And thank you for tuning in. See you next time. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.